Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So this is a rant. So if there's children around, evacuate them now. Um, by the time I finish the disclaimer, if you have not evacuated your children from the room or anyone that may be in need of crayons, a blanket, and a safe space, I'm not held accountable. And you can contact my crack legal team at Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. So I'm a bit late to the game on this, and that's not really intentional. Uh, I wasn't planning on ever making a video about anything about I'm going to discuss, but I'm going to have to. Because someone, yet again, has said stupid shit on the internet. I'm going to discuss the Jessica Yaniv situation. But I'm going to look at it from a different perspective. I'm, this is basically a literature review, a, uh, an essay, as it were, on the weaponization of discrimination when one individual chooses to manipulate and manufacture the narrative. So, let me just leave the following disclaimer, and I'm going to leave the same disclaimer in the description. Everything I'm about to say comes from research, and all the links are listed down below. So, everything I have as a talking point, I've got from at least one two, if not four, media sources. So, here's the disclaimer. I have no issues with Jessica and Eve whatsoever. I have no issues how she, how she chooses to express herself in regards to her romantic or sexual relationships, how she chooses to express herself in regards to her gender, gender identity, how she chooses to express herself in regards to her gender expression, or how she just generally chooses to represent herself to the world. I don't care, right? Um, this video, it, it's not in the scope of this video to discuss or report any of the alleged events that have occurred in her world. I'm not going to discuss any of the allegations in regards to inappropriate uh, behaviors or sexually based advances towards minor children. I'm not gonna discuss any of the alleged acts in regards to the potentiality of an underage pool party. I'm not going to discuss any of the alleged acts in regards to her apparent fetish in regards to tampons, sanitary pads, and menstruation. I'm not going to discuss her alleged arrest for um, uh, possessing prohibited weapons in Canada, that being stun guns, bear spray, mace, or pepper spray, or any of the alleged threats uh, of violence in those regards. So I'm not going to discuss any of that. Okay? This video is specifically going to address her recent human rights claims in the province of British Columbia. This video is going to attempt to explore and demonstrate how Jessica is intentionally manufacturing and manipulating situations for her own gain, that she has created a script that she's going to follow, and as soon as you step outside of that script, she's going to attempt to entrap you unknowingly, unwittingly, into discrimination. And... Jessica, if you watch this, and I, I know you probably are, this video will not meet in any way, shape, kind, or form the Canadian legal definition of libel, slander, or defamation. Because in order to meet that criteria, what I'm going to have to say, I have to know to be false, and I have to know it's also intended to cause harm. So everything I say in this video is not A, and has the intention of causing harm, or B, I know to be false. I'm going to include <clears throat> all the links for the articles and videos down below I've used for reference. This video is my opinion. It's based on my observations, my perceptions, from the research I've completed on this issue. This video is intended and designed to give fair comment to the issues that are currently before the Human Rights Tribunal in the, British, in the province of British Columbia. And Jessica, one last caveat. If you attempt any legal action against me for what I'm about to say, that's going to require me to name all of the news organizations as co-accused and all the reporters as co-accused. So if you try to bring any action against me in the form of libel, slander, or defamation, I'm going to have to bring in Global News, CBC, the National Post, anyone that's listed in a reference document down below, I'm going to, I'm going to basically kitchen sink along as a co-accused because all of my information comes from their information. This is my interpretation, interpolation of their information. And one last disclaimer, this isn't one I take lightly. <clears throat> I'm going to have to use Jessica's current legal name and her dead name, that being Jonathan, as 
depending on the timeline you're talking about, she was either addressing herself and was legally identifiable as Jessica or addressing herself and legally identifiable as Jonathan. So simply for the use of the dead name, it's only for points of clarity and emphasis. I respect the fact that you've changed your name to Jessica. I respect the fact you choose to live as Jessica. I don't care about you. I don't know enough about you to care about you. I care about your behaviors because they have some definitive definitive consequences that I don't think you've quite thought out. So first off, let's talk about when in Canada is it legal to discriminate? Because it's legal to discriminate. So I'm not going to talk about the government discriminating because the government can discriminate how they choose to. I'm talking about private individuals and businesses. I'm going to base my conversation about that from the, the confines of the province of Ontario. British Columbia is pretty much similar, but I'm just going to talk about Ontario. So under the Ontario Human Rights Code, it's legal to discriminate when <clears throat> there's a bona fide operational critical need. I have to do the thing, and unfortunately that thing I have to do discriminates against you. Um, so for example, you work in construction. You're required to wear a brain bucket, a hard hat, a melon protector. However, you have a religious belief that requires you to wear some other form of headdress. And your religious belief forbids you from either covering the headdress or removing it and substituting something else in, in place of it. Well, if you refuse to remove your religious headdress and then adopt the required personal protection in the workplace, or if you refuse to put that personal protection on over top of your religious headdress, that's bona fide operational critical need. The Human Rights Commission of the province of Ontario would say, hey, you know what? It's more important you don't get a brain injury. So take off your religious headgear. That's what a bona fide operational need would be. Then in order for the business to prove it's still able to discriminate, they'd have to prove there's an undue hardship. Like in order for me to do this for you, it's going to be so difficult for me as a business to do this for you, I can't. They're gonna base that first off internal financial needs. Me as a business, I'm gonna spend so much money just to do that thing for just one person or a very small segment of the population, it's not worth it, right? Or I'm now gonna have to spend money externally to my company. I'm gonna have to bring in a third party to train my staff. I'm now gonna have to bring in specialized equipment, which requires me to bring in a third party to train my staff. Um, I'm gonna have to hire a third party consultant to come in and do some special assessment and then train my staff. And then the last one is undue hardship based on health and safety requirements. Uh, basically, you want an accommodation, but to do so would not be inside the confines of health and safety. Again, we get back to religious headdress, right? Um, they can say, hey, listen, there's not only a critical need that you wear a hard hat because our insurance company requires it. You also need to wear a hard hat because it's a workplace health and safety issue if you don't. And lastly, when you get into situations of accommodation where your employer or that business has decided, yes, we do need to accommodate you, that yes, we have to make some allowances uh, outside the normal, those plans have to be based on dignity, individualization, and inclusion. Okay? Uh, and as soon as you can't meet any of those, again, you get back to the can we legally discriminate thing. Uh, now, for the Americans who've been watching this all unfold, you don't quite understand the human rights situation in Canada. Basically, the human rights tribunals or are created in the provinces and territories in Canada so that the little guy, me or Jessica, can go after the big guy because we don't have the financial resources to take them to court. So you go to a court-like environment that's still based off the rules of evidence. You still get sworn in. You still can be held accountable for perjury. And basically, it's a rather informal but structured process. And it's basically, so I don't have to go get a lawyer. You can represent yourself at Human Rights. Um, you probably might need a lawyer. Maybe not. It all depends. But basically, in a nutshell, Jessica Yaniv is asking for a legal precedent that female estheticians not be allowed the agency, not be allowed the right to refuse to touch a male body regardless if that's on religious grounds, regardless if that's on cultural grounds, regardless if that's their personal comfort level, 
regardless if they don't have the skill set or the equipment, regardless if um, the reason Jessica Yaniv is asking for any female that identifies as a female who chooses not to be in contact with a male who identifies as a male now perform a very specific and intimate procedure. Basically, you want the government of British Columbia to strip away the right of consent. That's what you want. Because as soon as you say, you know what, a female doesn't have the right not to touch male genitalia. Well, I'm a straight cis white guy. I'm the oppressor. Um, I can then go into any esthetician and go, wax my junk. I don't care if you don't want to touch it. The law says you have to wax my junk. We're going to get into waxing the junk later, but that's essentially what Jessica wants. Is it fair for one person to be able to have the government tell all the other persons, you no longer have the right to your self-autonomy, you no longer have the right to your, self your, your, your own agency, and you no longer have the right of consent. You, know, you no longer have the right of refru refusal. You must service, without a happy ending, anyone that walks into your shop. This is not the case of bake a cake, make me a dress. Right? This isn't the case of a highly religious individual refuses to make a gay wedding cake or refuses to make a wedding dress or a suit for a gay couple that's getting married or a lesbian couple. That is not this case. This is a case whereby you are looking for very specific, intimate encounters that may not have a sexual context. Uh, there, there's no looking for gratification other than, than grooming standards. There's no looking for the happy ending or a sense of release, um, except for the removal of hair. But again, you're asking for something very unique. And again, Jessica, I don't think you thought this one out. I really don't think you have. So first off, let's discuss some legal things. First one is vexatious litigant. So that's a thing in Canada that's rare. You can only be declared a vexatious litigant by a judge. And it's, a, it's something the judge is very cautious about handing out. Because once that's gone down range, it, you can't take it back. Once you've been declared a, vexa a vexatious litigant, any, any other action you want to take before the courts has to be approved by a judge. This is reserved specifically for those that appear in a court often and they appear in a court with events that appear to have little merit and might be considered frivolous. Uh, Jessica has yet to meet those um, criteria, but she's circling the drain on that one. She's getting pretty close. Why? Because she, it appears from the research I've done, she's filed approximately 29 human rights complaints. It appears 16 of those were made in 2019, 13 of those were made in 2018. At least one person has gone out of business because of this, uh, mainly due to the unnecessary media exposure and the litigation. Uh, and there's a lot of expense because as soon as you have a human rights complaint against you, you have to take action. It's not something you can just like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bill collector. He'll go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's the census people. No, no, it's some guy talking about what TV show did you watch last night? It's not one of those situations. If you ignore a human rights tribunal notice, you're going to be found at fault automatically. And then basically Jessica can go, well, give me what I want. And the tribunal's going to go, well, you didn't respond to us. So you must not care about it. So you must be guilty. So pay this, do this. Right. Um, now, at least as of currently, it appears there's 19 cases before the human rights tribunal right now in British Columbia. Three have been handled during uh, the mediation process where there's been a mediation and she may or may not have received a payout. Three of those cases, Jessica withdrew uh, her challenge as soon as those respondents or defendants had said, hey, I've got a lawyer and I want to defend this issue, which leaves approximately 13 left before right now. So Jessica withdrew 13, sorry, three complaints. Jessica withdrew three complaints in a row. When she did this, 
Uh, Devin Cousineau, and I'm sorry if I mangled your name, she is the tribunal member, read as adjudicator, judge. She raised the issue that Miss Yaniv has the potential to be a vexatious litigant. However, right now I can't call you a vexatious litigant. I'm just going to call you a frequent litigant. Now, frequent litig litigant in Canada has no legal meaning attached to it. So you just frequently show up to court or a court-like situation. That's all that really means. However, Miss Cousineau did say that Miss Yaniv is unnecessarily duplicating things and it's she questions her motives for having so many complaints ongoing simultaneously when many of these complaints are almost identical. And Miss Cousineau called Jessica's tactics improper when she had withdrawn complaints at the point of you submitted a defense statement. So basically the way this works with the human rights tribunals is my rights are offended and I become so offended because my rights have been offended, I file a human rights complaint. The human rights complaint people look it over and they go, yes, this appears on the face of it to be, be a human rights complaint. I'm going to now forward this off to the person who's alleged to have committed the offense. That person then has 30 to 60 days, depending on the province, to respond in writing. If you respond in writing and I get your response, I now have to either accept the fact that, you know what, this is going to go bad and I don't want to continue this, or I respond. Once I make the response to the response, that sounds bad, but that's the way it is. Um, once I give my response to the initial attempt at a defense, then the Human Rights Commission looks at it again and go, yes, that appears to be a legitimate complaint. Yes, that appears to be a legitimate response. And the counter argument to the response all appear to be valid. We need to proceed. Now, you have two options in a human rights tribunal. You can agree to mediation, kind of you have a discussion, or you can agree to a hearing. Right? Depending on what you want to do, you might decide, you know what, I just want to take this to mediation. I don't want the time and hassle of having to go to court. You know, let's just get this over and done with. Right? Or, you know what, I think I can mediate this. However, if you fail mediation, you can then go to the hearing. Or if you feel the necessities, you can say, you know what, I'm going to skip the mediation and I'm going to go right to a hearing. It all depends on you. It all depends on the province. Every province is different. So let's just talk about my experiences. I have been discriminated against. I don't leave my, my, my place of residence looking for discrimination. It finds you. So I was in a bicycle shop in my city. And because of my stroke, I have many invis invisible disabilities, one of them being balance. I'm in this bicycle shop going, fuck, a two-wheel bike's not going to cut it. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I asked the proprietor, because it's a small business, Hey, do you got any three or four wheel recumbent bikes? No, nope, we don't stock them. Okay, does anyone you deal with stock them? No, nope, we don't bring them in. Okay, fair enough. And then I'm like, do you have any idea where I can get them? Yeah, wait a minute, I do. He runs to the back and grabs me a business card. So I grab my cell phone, I take a picture of the business card, and then I go home and I call the gentleman. Now, why does that business choose to not cater to recumbent bicycle folks? They're between three and seven thousand dollars. How many of those is he going to sell in a year? Some of the components of a recumbent bike may be universal or cross compatible with the bikes he would normally sell. Some of them may not. Some of them may be a very special order. So, was I discriminated against in that store? Yeah, I was. But then again, all businesses discriminate. I don't go into Tim Hortons. Right? A coffee shop with donuts, you know, and expect a steak. They have what they call a steak sandwich, but that's not, we all know it's not really a steak sandwich. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I don't go into a women's dress shop looking to buy a canoe. You can't buy a canoe in a women's dress shop. Fun fact, they're discriminating against canoeists. So all businesses discriminate. So it all depends on how you want to look at it. Right? So let's get into the facts. And I realize we're 20 minutes into a video, so we're going to get into the facts. So the facts are this. Jessica had at that time in 2018 been up until November 2018 being used male pronouns on her social media accounts, such as LinkedIn and Facebook representing herself as 
Jonathan Yaniv, right? Also using a display picture that would get the average person to believe that Jonathan is male, presenting as male. Regard this is not issue. This issue has nothing at this point to do with genitalia. At the point when Jonathan had filed her complaints, she had legally changed her name to Jessica. However, sorry, my mistake. At the time Jonathan had filed the complaints, Jonathan was still Jonathan. Jonathan became Jessica after she filed her complaint. She changed her driver's license and she changed her um, other legal identity papers to female and Jessica. So when this all happened, she was still legally Jonathan. She was still, quote unquote, legally a man. Okay. Historically, Miss Yaniv also admits to have receiving Brazilian wax waxing procedure at the Merle Norman Salon in Langley, British Columbia, but was denied that in Burnaby, British Columbia. She then filed a human rights complaint against the Burnaby location it is subsequently shut its doors. Technically, this video ends now. Because, Jessica, if you've already found a location that's going to wax your junk, why do you need to look for a new location to wax your junk? Like, if, you, if you've admitted to the tribunal that you have already located a business and you've had a discussion with that business and you've been to that business for the procedure that you're looking for anyways, why are you going somewhere else? You are now, essentially, this now proves my point. You are creating situations, you're manipulating people, you're manufacturing dissent, you're trying to create discrimination. Okay? So, when you were legally Jonathan, you took to Facebook, because you know what, when I'm looking for an intimate waxing service, I'm going on Facebook, that's where I'm going to go. I'm not going to go to say like the yellow pages online or Google because a quick Google search will happen to find businesses in the greater Vancouver area that offer the manzillion, right? That have specific training, the specific equipment, specific knowledge, technical expertise to whack the, wax the junk you have, right? So here's some other difficulties. During these interactions on Facebook Messenger, Jessica contacted people under the name Jonathan, under the name Jessica, typically was using stereotypical male pictures, also pictures of himself wearing makeup, also used numerous fake profiles, numerous fake names, and numerous photos. So, Jessica, depending on the time in the year, you're either the king or the queen of sock puppetry. How many sock puppet accounts how many fake accounts, how many alternate accounts do you have control over? Right? So you used sock puppet accounts, fake profiles, fake pictures to contact these people. Right? You contacted over a dozen estheticians to request a Brazilian wax job. Right? And in response to the complaints, when people try to argue in their defense, right, before this turned into a human rights debacle, that... They don't have the training to wax male genitalia. They don't have the technical skills to wax male genitalia. They're worried about causing you physical harm or damage. Try to tell me you wouldn't complain that if someone put hot wax on your testicles and they went rippy rip and you needed stitches, you're not going to file a complaint. If your answer, Jessica, is yes, I wouldn't have complained, you're a liar. Because based on your behavior, oh, you would have complained. At least it's my perception you're a liar. Allegedly, you would have lied. It, it's my belief that you would have created a situation where you would have lied to answer that. Yeah, you fucking right, you would have complained. Okay. Um, some of them had religious or cultural object, objections. Right? Due to my religion, due to my culture, I cannot do that. Okay. Uh, you know, I, this now becomes into my rights, your rights. I'm trans, you're religious. And again, this is a bake a cake or make a suit situation. This is, I want you to touch my junk. Okay. Um, they, didn't they didn't want to perform the procedure due to personal safety reasons. These women either travel to your home or you travel to their home ostensibly. They didn't feel safe or comfortable with you home alone with them or them home alone with you. Um, even if Macaulay Culkin did get involved in this to be home alone with a bunch of you, I still don't think it's going to happen. Not only that, if you are going to be in their home, 
you were going to be in their home when their children were present, and they just didn't feel comfortable with that because they work at home alone. Also, they didn't have the right supplies to make this. And the last one is due to personal reasons of dignity, either yours or theirs. They just didn't want to do it. Yeah. Now, the interesting piece is all the respondents, when they testified, said they didn't quite understand what Jessica Inev meant in calling himself a transgender woman at that time, because at that time, Jessica was A, Jonathan, but B, he still had the man bits. So many of the 16 respondents are recent immigrants to Canada. Many of them are women of color. Many of them have English as a second language. Many of them had religious and cultural backgrounds, which made it forbidden for them to have a close interaction with male genitals other than that of their husbands. And when it comes down to it, a lot of them said, had you had the surgery and things had been removed and reshaped, they would have performed the waxing on you. Right? So I'm not going to use any of the respondents' names because it's unnecessary. If you really want to know who they are, they're in the links below. Right? So respondent number one, a Sikh woman uh, who operates the business from her home with small children present. Yaniv told her initially that she's on her period and wanted to know if you could work around the string, meaning the tampon string. Because the esthetician had said, hey, if you're on your period, that's kind of okay, but can you wear a tampon just to make sure things aren't too messy? And Yaniv agreed, I'll wear a tampon. Um, Yaniv later at the hearing testified that she had not been menstruating and that she had lied to this woman that she'd been on her period and that she'd used a fake account and fake account details to talk to this woman. So she's representing herself as a woman, transgender or not, who this woman is being led to believe does not have a penis, scrotum, testicles, but has a vulva with the labia, major and minor, you know, the clitoris, you know, the vagina, all the bits. So, and Yaniv also admitted at that time, she still had male genitalia and as far as the world knows, she still does because she's on a wait list. She has yet to have had the surgery. Okay. She also testified, respondent number one testified, she had no experience dealing with a penis or a scrotum in a waxing sense. Um, so she didn't know what to do, right? That she wouldn't feel safe or comfortable in having an unrelated, you know, a non-biological or unrelated by marriage male in her home alone due to her religion and cultural practices, she's not allowed to touch the genitals of someone who isn't her husband. Right? And then when Yaniv cross-examined respondent number one, respondent number one said that had Yaniv been post-operative and had a vagina, regardless if she was naturally born as a woman or a transgender woman post-surgery, she would have done the procedure. She would have happily touched the vagina. Right? but she can't touch male genitals, right? And when Yaniv asked this individual, hey, but would you give a haircut to me? And she said, yes, because you don't have a penis on your head. Best quote ever, right? So I'll give you a haircut. That's because you don't have a penis on your head. I have no problem with that. But the penis, I'm not touching it. I'm not going near it. My religion, my cultural, my sense of beliefs, my personal practices prohibit me from coming in contact with your penis. Then respondent number two is again a Sikh woman. She has a disability, a developmental delay apparently. She also has epilepsy. She travels to clients' homes. Um, both her husband and her father testified that they have fears for her safety and also due to her cultural beliefs, her religious practices, she can't wax a man. Right. Again, we get into the issue of it's not a cake, it's not a dress, it's not a suit, it's an intimate procedure where I'm required to touch you. My religion forbids that. Right? And then respondent number two also now apparently uh, is in the throes of anxiety and depression. And you know what? No one should be induced into anxiety and depression 
due to the actions of another person. That's reprehensible. Now let's talk about respondent number three. Remarkably, she's from Brazil. Imagine that, a Brazilian that gives a Brazilian, right? So she also works from her home. And she testified, she believed that Yanev, as Yanev described herself as transgender, she thought that had, she had an honest and genuine belief that that meant, oh, you've had the surgery. You've had your bits removed and rebuilt, right? So, and she testified, if Yanev had had a vagina and been a post-operative transsexual woman, she would have happily performed the procedure on Yanev, right? Um, and again, Yanev had used a sock puppet account, had used the account of a, and a picture of a pregnant woman to start the conversation. So initially the conversation starts, you get a picture of a pregnant lady going, hey, I need my vagina waxed. Okay, I'll wax your vagina. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're not what you say you are? Mm, right? And respondent number three said she, she didn't have any training to wax male genitalia. Right? That she didn't feel comfortable waxing male genitalia. So I'm not going to do the job. I don't have the training to do it. And I don't feel comfortable. Would you hire an untrained carpenter to build you a house? No, you wouldn't. Would you hire, you know, someone who's not trained to do a specific task that requires specific equipment, you know, and if it's done wrong, can cause damage? I think the answer in the reasonable world is no. But, and then when respondent number three basically refused uh, Jessica's requests, Jessica then decided to harass respondent number three at a gym where she had a part-time job. So you didn't do what I wanted, so I'm going to now track you in the world and harass you. Does everyone kind of get where this is going? Because I hope you do. Now let's talk about willful ignorance. So there's a lawyer, last name I believe is, Mr. is Cameron, so Mr. Cameron um, has chosen to take on pro bono, meaning for no cost at all, the defense of some of these ladies. And Mr. Cameron, I applaud you. You are truly an amazing individual and I don't drink anymore, but if I'm over out your way and you need a pint of Guinness, I'm buying. And if you don't drink Guinness, you're still drinking it. <clears throat> So there was an expert witness that the respondent's lawyer brought in. Now, the fun fact about an expert witness, you have to prove you're an expert. The court just doesn't magically accept the fact you're an expert. You have to prove you're an expert. And then I can counter the fact that, no, I don't think you're an expert, and here's why. So either... The expert witness is so expert, it was self-evident, and the tribunal went, yep, I declare you an expert, it makes perfect sense. And Jessica Yaniv had no ability to counter the claim that this person's an expert, or Jessica, you're your own worst lawyer, you have no idea what you're doing, and you weren't able to make a counter-argument that the expert's not an expert. So guess what? You got stuck with an expert. This expert witness, Angie Bartonson, she's 29 years of experience as an esthetician. She operates her own salon. And she provides male waxing. She, she does this. Now, she also said in the province of British Columbia, there is no accredited program for male waxing. So if I'm going to use the defense, I'm not trained. You're right. I'm not trained because I can't go to a community college or a beauty school that offers like a certificate course in ball cleanup. Right? So she does teach this skill at her salon so if you want to pay her money she'll teach you how to do it right uh because she explained that waxing male to female genitalia is is a drastically different procedure and then if you do it wrong you can cause significant serious injury right she explained that waxers now have to hold and manipulate a penis and scrotum uh, that it requires you moving the penis and scrotum in various directions and that because of these manipulations, occasionally things become a bit erect. And sometimes men expect the happy ending. And when you don't give them the happy ending, uh, they become violent. So she, 
She also stated that as a trainer uh, at teaching male genitalia waxing, it's not generally taught due to a couple of reasons. One, a lot of the students that go to these esthetician schools are very young. Two, a lot of these schools have students attend that have, again, religious or cultural sensitivities that would pretty much forbid them from even attending that class. Right? So, this is then countered by Jessica. Jessica says that she's a woman in every single way, and therefore her genitals are those of a woman. I'm not even going to debate that, because if that's how you see yourself, I'm fine. I'm going to deal with the physical realities. That if you happen to have a penis, scrotum, and testicles, right, um, the trinity, as it were, right, that this expert witness with almost 30 years experience, she said that you are very misinformed. Be, and although Jessica will say, well, no, you don't need special training. No, you don't need special equipment. But yet the expert witness, who you were not able to refute as being an expert, said, no, you need these things. Now let's get into some of the pre-existing condition issues. Right? And this is not a judgment. At the tribunal, both Jessica and her mother raised some issues that Je Jessica, at a very young age, around age six, was diagnosed with gender identity disorder. Great, prove it. You've been in a, basically a courtroom. You've made an assertion. That assertion is about age six, I was then a, 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 a diagnosed with gender identity disorder. Provide documentation to prove it. Simply to validate your claim. Okay? However, right now you're unwilling or unable to produce supporting medical evidence. Okay? I had a stroke. If you want to see the evidence, I'll give it to you in person. So you travel to me and I'll show you the paper from the hospital that says I had a stroke. Or you can talk to 150 people that happen to watch me have my stroke the day I had my stroke at work. Right? Um, next point is Jessica raised the point at the tribunal that she is intersex. She has the external sexual organs, both male and female, penis, scrotum, testicles, and female, that being the vulva. She has both external body parts. However, she says one of them is deformed, but unwilling to identify which, and she's unwilling to produce medical evidence to support that. That's an easy one, Jessica. Just go to the doctor the tribunal indicates and get the doctor to examine you, and that's literally 10 minutes of your life. If you are going to make um, claims in a illegal setting, you need to substantiate them. This will solve your argument. Your case is proven right then and there. Yes, I do. You can prove your case. Just submit a paper. Give them the documents. Right? All you simply said is you're not going to elaborate about how your intersex or how your body parts present. You simply said it exists. I watched that myself on a YouTube video, and the link is down below in the description. Now, lastly, we're going to get into Jessica's troubling behavior. Because there are some. And again, I'm not going to discuss any of the allegations or reported instances uh, that have yet to be tested in a court of law in regards to, you know, prohibited weapons or inappropriate behavior around children or any of that. I'm not doing any of that. We're going to discuss her specific troubling behavior specifically in reference to her human rights case. So it appears the majority of her claims are towards the East Indian community, be it Sikh, be it from Pakistan, be it from India, be they Punjabi, be they Hindi, be they whatever. That appears the majority of her complaints are towards the East Indian community. The majority of her complaints are towards new immigrants to Canada. The majority of her complaints are people that don't speak either of the official languages in Canada, being French or English. They speak another language. Um, so they have English as a second language as an issue, right? However, Jessica also has all these sock puppet accounts. And she claims that, oh, I didn't send that. That was that was, a, that was an imposter. That, that's a faker. That, that, that I was set up. 
again, Jessica, if you're going to say someone did that, but that was not me, that might have been my name, that might have been my picture, but that was not me, because you've actually admitted that you have sock puppet accounts or alternate accounts, that you've actually admitted these things, you are, you're going to have to prove which ones are real and which ones aren't. And if you can hear that, that's Crash the Wonder Bird in the window singing away. Have a little musical intro. We're good. So, Jessica, well, let's get back to your sock puppet accounts. Um, I don't believe you. If you're going to prove that these accounts were fake, you're going to need to have to prove these accounts were fake. And I'm going to believe all of the accounts were yours until you can provide substantive evidence. And I'm going to be honest, I don't think you can. Okay? So, going back as late as July 17th, 2019, you actually made um, statements on the internet calling for immigration raids to 120th Street in Surrey. Right? Uh, you've said things that people who lack English skills. Um, we've got a lot of immigrants here. They lie, they'll do anything to support their own kind and make things miserable for everyone else. Right? And in fact, one thing you said was like just ridiculous. Like why you even said this, I don't know. Yes, I did publish racist remarks because being denied services daily from the East Indian community at any business sucks. The immigrants are targeting trans people. We are the victims, not them. I don't get that. I, I don't get that. Right? And then, even your mother... I'm not going to say anything bad about your mom. That I'll leave that for another video, maybe. Um... Even your mother basically said that we shouldn't be wasting Canadian tax dollars to have translators at the Human Rights Tribunal. Well, those people wouldn't be at the Human Rights Tribunal if you hadn't raised the issue that they wouldn't wax your cock and balls. And then another point, you complained or compared one of the businesses that wouldn't provide you services to that being a neo-Nazi. I'm sorry? How is... That, that's almost undefendable. So, I hope over the last 42 minutes, and again, it's going to be a long one, this almost like the, the extreme games are in. Hope this sort of explains what I mean by Jessica and Eve is trying to manipulate and manufacture the narrative. She is specifically targeting businesses from the number of complainants so far they're predominantly East Indian, predominantly new immigrants, predominantly English as a second language, predominantly coming from cultures or religious belief practices that Jessica should already know would prohibit or definitely restrict them touching someone's penis that is not their husband's. Um, making claims that can't be substantiated. Right? If you're truly intersex, great. If you're truly intersex that has both male and female external genitalia, Great. If you've truly been diagnosed with gender identity disorder at age six, great. No one made this an issue but you. You made this the issue. No one would have known. I would have never known. I live a five-hour plane ride away from you. I'm in Ontario. You're in British Columbia. I would have never known any of these details about your life had you not made it an issue. So because you decided to make this an issue, you need to provide the proof. It's simple. Your entire claim just disappears with a couple pieces of paper. On that note, I'm going to step off my soapbox, and I'm not going to leave my normal outro, because this has nothing to do with having a stroke or stroke recovery. This is a rant based off a bigoted, horrible, narcissistic individual that is using the trans community, right, the, to, to dictate their own demands... When 20 minutes ago I said you've already found a salon that'll do the thing for you anyways, so you must have pissed that salon off and they don't want you to ever use a customer anymore. So on that note, just be good to each other. And if you happen to see someone that might be having a stroke, please call 911, help them out.